Okay, we got it pressed. It's pressed. Okay, we're, we're live. live. All right, we're live. We we missed our intro. Uh, I'm not quite sure what we did wrong, but next time we'll try to get the intro right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is the um, .NET uh, languages and runtime community stand up. That's what it's called, right? It is. It is absolutely. And uh, we're we're without Emma, who usually does the startup thing for us. So I think we kind of bumbled that. But uh, yeah, he's the he smart one. Either. Well, experienced in this. Yeah, he, he is smart though. Yeah. Okay, how about we introduce ourselves for those new to the show? Great idea. Let's Go introduce ahead. ourselves for everybody. Uh, I'm Kathleen Dollar. I am a PM on the uh, .NET team, uh, doing various different things, and uh, I am very happy to be here with you today. Yep, yeah, I'm Rich Lander, uh, also program manager on the .NET team, um, and. Uh, yeah, so we've got a few things that we want to talk about today that we've been working on. And uh, so how about we start with your your topics, yeah. Kathleen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things I want to talk about, I'm going to I'm going to like do a throwback here to start to start today. And, and I'll kind of come back to this. Um, but I, I want to start by uh, let's let me share this uh, this here. Uh, why is it much? Oh, sorry, we're, we're going to get this. All right. So um, I wanted to just kind of just throw back this throwback time, okay? To uh, this is just a little test, and it's a question for you about what happens uh, when you get to the top of an integer. So we're going to take an integer max value and we're going to add one to that, okay? And I'm going to challenge you for just a second to think about what you think happens. So do you think what's currently marked right here that an expe accepted uh, expected exception is thrown? Or do you think that uh, it is uh, it's successful and that therefore we hit the is true? So uh, make a guess for yourself. Uh, when I'm actually teaching this, actually wait for a minute, but I'm not going to make you do that. Uh, I am just going to do what most people think happens. And I'm going to undo the expected exception and run the test. Okay. So uh, some of you probably, and I'm keeping on doing this at the wrong place. Uh, I, since I have two copies of this, it's, come on, we can do this. Come on. Here we go. Uh, we're going to, we'll just run that and see if that passes or fails. Um, and uh, are we ready? We're not ready. I said to run. There, we're running. All right. All right. So this is going to, it's going to pass. It's going to fail. It's going to pass. It's going to fail. I actually don't know. I'm waiting for it. Uh, it didn't give me the little the little uh, thing there. So yeah, why is it taking so long? Yeah, what's going on here? This this worked fine when I ran it a little when I ran it last night. I haven't run it uh, since I started this up. If I updated my Visual Studio or something, I don't know. This I'm on is an like Not preview. a big app. <laughs> no, did it? Is it trying to run the whole thing? Uh, yeah, no. It well, the, the app has a few tests in it, but it's trying. It's trying. All right. Um, Okay, well, I may have to just like skip ahead. Uh, oh, it failed. Oh, look, it failed. Okay, that was the point. It failed. And the answer to what it happens on this is actually uh, it depends. And the, what it depends on is a value that is in project properties. And I'm going to get back to why I'm talking about this. So we're going to go to project properties, uh, project, project, uh, properties. And then we're going to go all the way down. Uh, I'm having obviously some speed uh, issues here. We're going to look at the build. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom to advanced. We're going to click on advanced and we'll come to, come to this little checkbox right here, which is check for arithmetic overflow and underflow. And just so we understand the what we're actually talking about, what this means is um, you may have heard that uh, that Berkshire Hathaway which doesn't do a stock split, hit a number that was so big in terms of its stock price that it broke the systems and they had to go and fix that. And if you think about that and you say, okay, what do we want to have happen if something hits a number that is too big? And the, prob the, the answer is probably not to roll over to the biggest negative number. And that's what happens uh, if this box is not checked. Instead of giving you an exception, this is too big, the number doesn't fit, here's an exception. Instead, it rolls over. Now. Why am I talking about that? First of all, I've been talking about that for a while and I, I really want people to know that because I think 
one of the best things you can do for your app is go check that box right now. Um, but we're finally uh, going to be uh, making a change to the templates on that. Um, it is a it's going to surprise people a bit, but in .NET six, uh, we feel like in .NET we can we can do things a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit you know make bigger changes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change that. Um, and it is in the templates going out in uh, in preview six, and then we'll look at, at reactions and see whether or not that's going to fly, and what adjustments we may need uh, to make on that. So let's go back to the question we were looking at, so you can see it again. Um, and that's why I'm going I'm to talk about templates. And so I just wanted, when we got there, to have you have some background on why we're making this particular change. Yeah, I have to admit, I didn't even. I, I certainly knew about integer overflow, but. Um... I didn't know that this setting existed, that you could opt in to a different behavior. And then the default is opting out. The default in C Sharp is opting out. In VB, the default is opting in. Um, so you 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 wind up your your uh, the default is that you roll to the to the largest negative number. So if if you if you want to think about how this works, we're just flipping bits along the way. And when all the bits get get full, then we flip back to them all being empty again. And that that's not quite the way it works, but it's probably close enough for this conversation. Um, and so will there be an option to enable this across all project and solution? We're not planning that. Could you please ask for that? You can ask for that in a variety of places. We'll move it if we don't like where you put it. Um, the uh, Roslyn repo is one possibility, although it, that's not where it would be implemented. The templating uh, repo is where it will be for new templates. But for existing things, uh, then, um, uh, and I'm going to take that back, Rich. I didn't think about that before, but I bet you can, because the way that if, if you check that, um, and this and is going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah, you should be able to do indirect directory props. And so let's do this. Let's create, let's run the, let's, uh, run the, uh, the new template. And I'll talk a little bit about the new template and then we'll come back to that question. Okay. So we'll get back to it. Um, but let's just, uh, clear this off just a little bit. Okay, so we have a new template. So if I do uh, .NET, and these are the same uh, templates that you're going to see in Visual Studio. I'll, I'll come back to that question. I'm going to do. I'm going to list what templates I have available. I don't think I have too many here. Um, and it's, I just installed a new uh, a new version. Why is my machine so slow? Just my machine is slow right now. All up. Uh, there we go. Okay, and I have too big a font, so it's wrapping and it's ugly. I apologize for that. But what I want to show you is that I have uh, a new template, if I can find it, called app. Where is my app template? I know it's here because I just, it's here somewhere. I just don't see it. It's called Simple Console App right here. Simple Console App. So um, the Simple Console App is a version uh, of a console app that is going to evolve. The, the console app, we're concerned about changing because there is a stupendous number of tutorials and comments on the existing console app. And to have one day, all of a sudden, it changed drastically would break an awful lot of people, an awful lot of teachers, um, whether they're uh, people teaching professionally to other developers or whether in high school or college, this would just break so much that, and we also think the name can be better. So we're going to switch to a new name, which is uh, app app. And that is under simple uh, console application is the name that we're using right now for that. All of this is in preview. And so you get to comment on it and we would love that. So I'm going to do uh, .NET new app. And then currently I'm in kind of a root directory. And uh, one of the other things we'd love, you know, feedback on whether this actually causes you problems is that we generally then, if we want to put it into a subdirectory, um, I'm going to, and I already have a temp, so I'm going to say temp2. Uh, now it's going to create a project named temp2 in a directory called temp2. So that's uh, dash o is for output. And so I'm going to run that. And it's going to take just a minute uh, to come back. And then another change that we've made, you'll see right here, is that. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, that was on install, not, not on this. This is the, the correct output here. Now, if I go to Visual Studio, I have one open that's empty uh, to try to speed this process up uh, to open a project. And I will open that to, to up. And that's in here, and it's in here. This is the one I just created. Okay, so let's now, let's flip back 
uh, to the question that we just asked about the um, uh, whether you can do this for your whole project, your whole solution. Okay, it was a great question, and because the way this comes, this shows up is to be uh, a line in your project file, then I can imagine no reason that you couldn't put this in a directory props file. Um, so a directory prop file sits high in your solution and provides properties for all of the projects within it. Now, if one of those projects restates that that one property, then the one in the project wins over the one in the solution. But you should be able to put this in your directory props. I never thought of this before. Um, I thought about actually what, as I was starting to answer the question. Um, so I think that's probably something that um, I'm working on a, a blog post to talk about this, to kind of prep us for this change in the templates. And uh, I'll, I'll include that. So uh, uh, yeah. Can you talk, Kathleen, about any, um, I guess two, two, two things, because I'm not sure you covered these, is what's, what's the change in behavior when you enable this to true and you do have an overflow? What's the different behavior that you observe? Right. And you know, what should you do in your code because of that? And then the second yeah. one is there's clearly more checks that are going on when this is enabled. So is there a performance hit? So great questions. Okay, to start with, so when this is on, you will get an exception and hopefully you're already handling exceptions in your application. But if you're not, then I would work at that, uh, look at that all up. So if, if this is turned on, you will get an exception. If this is turned off, you will roll around the boundary, either upwards or downwards. So if you add one to the largest integer, then you will go to the, uh, to the largest negative integer. Um, and if you are uh, going the other direction, if you have the largest negative and you subtract one, you would go to the largest one. So it, it, it is, this is deliberately switching from a logical error, which means that in the case of the Berkshire Hathaway hitting the top, then it means that they would owe everybody you know, for the price of their stock instead of just throwing an exception in the system, doing whatever it needs to do in response uh, to that. It, it, they had briefly unlisted them. I'm sure they've resolved it by now. Um, so that we're, tra we're trading that off. Generally having, you know, something be fundamentally wrong behavior is worse than an exception. And so we're, we're, we're sliding around the exception. That's the first question you asked. Can you remind me what the section is? Uh, well, yeah, just, just okay. one point though. You said, you know, if you're handling exceptions, to my mind, that's not necessarily the best way to think about it because like we don't recommend that people have a try catch at the top of their app other than for logging. So I think this would be a change to people's code where they would um, uh, they would have a catch statement for a specific exception type that they didn't have before, right? Um, well, if, unless they're doing a generalized, uh, a general exception. Um, but that would just be for logging, right? Like I, our guidance would be to, it, it like you know if you've got this try catch at the top of your app that you know is just catching for exception uh we would recommend that people do not um what's the word i'm trying to say recover from that you, right you, die, you let the app recover. die right i would not suggest you that you recover from this um the way that the way i used to do apps was to do was to have a generalized exception that said i'm going to die because i don't know what happened and then specific exceptions at the right place for anything i thought i could recover from so you know this is one that i might let you know float up at some point to let the application uh die hopefully your application is resilient to just dying in the middle um but um there's other reasons your app might die in the middle yeah. It is another though suggestion though, like imagine you do have this situation where you have inter integer overflow. Might you switch to a larger integer type as no, another one yes. of the solutions? Yes. You absolutely might. You absolutely might do that. And if you're switching from um, from a short to an int, then that's a really good answer because shorts aren't really um, fundamentally um, more, shorts aren't cheaper than, than ints. So, uh, you know, so 32 bit int, very friendly thing. If you happen to be using a 16 to 16 bit, go into 32 bit. Going from 32 bit to 64 bit 
um, is often the right thing to do. Um, but it also something just to slightly think about just because you do see a performance um, hit on that one. And your option is to go to a decimal. And so even though decimal also handles fractions, if that manages to get you into the right, uh, the, the right scope, then that would be the option. And decimal always uh, throws an exception. Um, it never does an underflow overflow. Uh, it's only the integers that do that. So decimal is the other thing you might look at, just depending on what you're doing and you know, take a step back. If you hit that number, obviously you need to, to fix your program. And it either happened because there was a bad calculation or something bad happened. It should never have been that big, or you really do need it to be that big, in which case you need to look at a bigger, a bigger space. Um, and, and one of the ways to do that is definitely to make it, just make it a bigger integer. For sure. Yeah. And so the second question is, if you do this check, is there an observable difference in performance? Yeah. So this is a this is a great question. And it there may be places that, that it, it, it is. So um, it, it happened to be the default because back in, in 2000, 2001, when .NET was just starting out, there actually was a fairly significant performance difference. That has been minimized over the years. And it's, it's very small. And for most code, you could not find this. If you're doing millions of calculations, you may be able to. But you can still have this checked. And then in that part of your code that's doing millions of calculations, you can turn it off and let it um, and, and stop doing the checks uh, with the word unchecked. There's a keyword checked and unchecked. And you can um, switch back and forth between it um, in the body of your code without changing this checkbox, without changing your project file um, as you are just working through your, your application. So that got us off on an old thing instead of a new thing. And so people feel free to tell us whether it's nice for you if we come into like some old thing that we really, really wish you knew. Um, and I'm doing it today because of this change in templates and uh, you know, trying. We, we're going to be figuring out through the course of, um, of the next preview whether we need to limit the scope of this or whether we just need to do it and you know that type of thing. Um, so that's that's where we're going uh, on the on that part of the new template. But I need to show some more stuff on the new template. So let me right. uh, get that shared again because um, I didn't show you the exciting part. This is why we're doing the work. Okay. So let's let's bring this up. Uh, come on. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, right. There we go. All right. So what do you think? It's a little shorter than it used to be. I don't have the other one up for comparison, but that is the that is the the file. There is um, you know, there is uh, just using um, there is uh, right. So we're talking about top level statements. I don't think yeah, you said that. Level statements. This is what they look like. Yep. Yeah. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about global usings? Because that's a feature I that's coming in. That. Yeah. So let we can we can do that right now. So yeah. So we will probably have global using when we send this out. It's just that we we had a lot of conversations about which way we should go on this, and as we have been going through that conversation, um, we just kind of landed on global using. This is an error, I think, just because. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the reason that right now you have to use preview today. So we would also have to put preview in here, which you do this way. Uh, come on. Come on. Uh, wow, it is so slow. Now, and I'm also hitting some, I'm also being wonky on hitting some uh, some keys here. So part of this is me. I've got two, I, I, I'm just not used to sharing my screen most time. Um, Emo does it this particular way. So I'm clicking sometime on the wrong monitor, and that's not helping the situation. So anyway, preview, uh, you want to say line version equal preview uh, to get around that error. And uh, so at the moment, we just don't have the global using in there, but we may get it back. Um, yeah, I think it's the way we expect people to use global using is that we expect that people are going to gravitate to. And this is a place that we trust the intelligence of the community to find the right answer. Uh, and what we think that's going to be is that most uh, projects will have a usings.cs file and all of the global usings will be in one place because, oh my gosh, they can be anywhere and that's crazy making. And so we think that people will gravitate to having all global usings in a single location in a file probably called usings. And so uh, we'll see how that goes. But then you'll see that there is no namespace, there is no class, there is no method. So everything here uh, following the using statements is just code in a method that's created in, uh, in, the, in the compiler. Uh, we have a method and a class and a, and a uh, namespace. The namespace doesn't matter here. Um, 
that's just made. It's just made for you, so you don't have to do it. So it's just a matter of a way to make it simpler uh, for you to just start writing code. And we're, that's why we've called this for right now simple. Um, we may rename that, but at the moment, that's that's what we've been going with. So there's another change here that I, I have to shout out. And it's really funny because somebody said this right at the beginning in the chat. Um, they said, hello, world. And they said it the way I always say it, which is with no comma. And we got a feedback issue that there should be a comma. And as we went and looked around, we actually decided there probably should be a comma. So Rich, you actually know this stuff. Uh, you know the English language really well. So you can comment, comment on our comma. We're not going to change the existing template. We, but, but we thought going forward, we'd go ahead and respect this. Because when we looked on Wikipedia, it, it was hello comma world. And as we looked around, we decided to go with that. So what do you think from an English perspective? Is that a, should we have the comma in there? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Um, All right. it's, uh, so world is clearly a noun. I, I actually don't really know what <laughs> grammatical type hello is. You see, you know, this is where I was on it. We don't have to go deep into this. I just looked around and decided that looking at samples around that there, there was a majority of them had the comma so i decided to go with the request and include a comma here but that's one of the things that we can we can think about as we're going uh as we do the uh, yeah. yeah i guess actually what it is now that i'm i'm thinking about it i think it probably relates to hello being a cl complete clause on its own i think uh, that's probably what the rule is Okay. It, it, it's it's slightly more obvious if you say like, "Good morning, Kathleen." Uh, could just "Good morning" just has a little bit more weight right. to it than "hello" okay. does. And right. I, I think the issue is is that those are complete clauses. All right. Well, I thought I'd I, I'd ask you that, but I thought it was going to take us just like forty five seconds, so we probably don't need to go deeper on that. Um, okay. So uh, I have done something where I can no longer see the chat. And so if, um, if, and I also cannot get rid of my, I cannot change the display. So if nobody has any questions on this code, uh, you could kill my, um, you could kill my screen share for the moment. And let me see if I can figure out, um, uh, figure this out. Uh, I'm going to- I uh, killed your screen share. Yeah, uh, so now I, uh, exit full screen. Good, I, I think I'm happy now. Good. Okay. So, do we have any um, any questions yeah. coming up? Yeah, we do. I, I so one of them was um, oh, yeah. So one from Fuel Snable Snable was uh, just to check. We are not changing the default behavior of int underflow overflows. Correct. We will not do that. We will not do that. I, I can say that with some confidence. Um, yeah. So that, the thing I was confused yeah confused though about with that is. I thought you were maybe suggesting setting this value in the templates, or is that incorrect? I, I, okay. There's two questions here. Are we going to change the behavior in your current application? And the answer is no. Are we going to change the default behavior in the template? And the answer is yes. We're going to. That is that is what we are doing for .NET six in the preview six, so that we can get feedback on it. I think it's probably the right thing to do, um, but uh, I think. It's because I think people don't know what's happening today, so they'll they won't see the the difference, and it will only affect new obviously new programs. Uh, but if we get negative feedback about it, we're that's you know that's what we want is uh, is we want to get feedback on that particular question. But we're going to do it, and if we don't get negative feedback, then that is going to be what we're doing on that six. I think it's the right thing to do because so many people. I am I never cease to be amazed how many people do not know that this occurs. And I think if you're writing uh, code, having it be reliable uh, and a, an exception is always better than just a wrong answer coming out. Yeah. Of blue. Uh, do you know of what the behavior is for integer overflow in other languages? Like for example, what Java does? It varies by language. I don't know what, what individual, I don't happen to know what individual language oh, okay. is, but it does vary by language. Yeah. Okay. It, it is, uh, and, and some of the older languages, um, uh, do it, it used to be expensive, and so until we got modern systems that can um, that they can swallow uh, the the check really easily, 
then um, it, there was a tendency to uh, overflow and underflow. And more often, newer things, I suspect, are giving exceptions. Okay, this question is a little further afield from that, but it says, uh, this is also from the same person. Uh, this is a language stand-up, so let me ask if we could get uh, conditional deconstructs. Uh, I want to deconstruct the returns of bool and the pattern match to fail if it is false. Wow. Okay, so that's deep enough to think about that I am going to suggest that you put that as an issue on C-Sharp Line. So uh, github.net C-Sharp Line. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, it, it is It is a super interesting. Yeah, let's let put that on C-Sharp Line with a little bit more there. I don't have my okay. head fully around what you're asking for, um, but then you're the right people are going to think about it. Um, because uh, any chance, you know, um, the, the, we, we had, we did one of these stand-ups where we talked to Mads about the process and uh, it, it, it's a pretty involved process and it starts with somebody saying, I think this is a good idea. So put it out there and start the process. That'd be great. Yeah. So the, <laughs> this was one for me actually, but I, so um, what happened is I was writing this, uh, this device binding in the .NET IoT repo and uh, like the value that uh, I had was always like going to be quite small. And so I yeah. thought, well, let's just use um, uh, a byte. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's basically the the eight bit numeric value. If you look mm -hmm. on C sharp docs, um, it actually lists byte in the integral yeah. uh, type. So mm -hmm. I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, this is awesome. I'm like being performance sensitive. Um, and then I talked to Jan about it, and he said, don't do that. He said, um, the pro pro modern processors are oriented on 32-bit values, and they, they actually, uh, like, almost, like, virtualize. I, I might be, like, massively not quite saying what he said correctly, but what I took from it is they actually, like, virtualize smaller values, like 8-bit ones, in terms of 32-bit ones, and that it's, it's yeah. actually, at best, byte is the same as as a 32-bit integral number, and at worst, it's it's slightly worse. So but but slightly, slightly is the really important word here, is that there's two reasons that you might use byte, one of which is performance. And yeah, you know, it's gone, not there, for the processor. There's actually three reasons. Another one might be that you're storing a large number of them, and you can store them more efficiently because of the way that you're, you are storing them, then you can store the, the 256, um, the two, that space um, more efficiently. And, and you care about that. So that's the second reason. The third and most important reason is that all of your values will be between zero and 255, and you actually want an exception if right. it's bigger than 255 or in some very unusual algorithms you want it to uh, roll over to, to the negative number. So if there's a reason that you want those behaviors, then that's the reason to use a byte. Oh, and and totally. you should. So there's no reason to stay away from byte. It's just there's no benefit of it, which is why the 64 bits not that way. So 30 put two bits is a sweet spot, and any you know making a bigger value up to 30 to 32 bit, just do it. Don't worry about it. But once you hit 32 bit, then pause because as you go to 64 bit, it, it is definitely slower. Even though we're on 64 bit processors, they're tuned to 32 bit numbers, and the reason for that is that's the size of memory. Um, 64 bits just way bigger than you need to address memory. Okay, here's one for you since you said this. <laughs> Have you heard me talk about this before? <laughs> I do this in every one of my, I do a workshop um, that I'm, I'm missing tomorrow. Uh, Jeff Fritz is giving it for me um, on things that that programmers don't know that they should know. And this is one of them. And the reason is that doubles are bi uh, they're, they're, uh, binary numbers. So they're based on base two. And base two cannot represent some numbers that are very important to us, like point one. Um, so if you think about the way you learned um, arithmetic in kindergarten or whenever you learned to divide, one divided by three is 0.333 repeating, okay? So the binary value of, of 0.1, which is 10 cents, it's a very common number for us, the binary value for that is repeating, okay? So it also does the same thing. And so we cannot represent it exactly. Um, and so when you go from, um, uh, do any conversions with double, um, then you have the potential to actually lose, um, uh, lose some precision. But even if you don't do that, then you're going to convert between human centric, which is base 10 and base two. 
and you always risk being wrong in that. So people talk about rounding problems. Well, the, all of those rounding problems, if we can stay in the base, if we could think in base two, we would be fine using doubles, but we think in base 10. So even if your program has no conversions whatsoever, you convert as you go into and out of your program from base 10 to base two. And conversions are always problematic. You can, now the IEEE spec is really, really tall. And when I'm actually doing this um, uh, in a workshop, what I do then is um, I, I, I play around with some stuff. This is, you know, uh, this can happen. It's, it's I, I make sure it happens that day. Um, and I do it and I have it set with to a 32-bit processor and it has one answer and I change it to a 64-bit processor and it has another answer. The IEEE spec can, you know, has, it has fluff in it. And so there is no guarantee. Decimal is always base 10. It is always, always base 10. You don't have that conversion. And double is faster, but the difference in that speed, you will almost no program can find. If you are doing millions of calculations, yes, look at look at what data type you're using, but otherwise just use decimal. The, the decimal data type uh, does not lose enough performance. It's still very fast. So yeah. Global static usings, we thought about it. I don't think we're doing it right now. So uh, Go ahead and see Sharp Lang, uh, you know, let them know if you think it's useful. We thought it was scary. We thought, oh, so yeah. Global type aliases, I don't think so. I think yeah, we're it's somewhat similar. Now. It's same reasons. For right now, we thought that because it's it's not in this file, you can't just look at the top and see what's going on, that for right now, we said we're just going to stick to just the user. Uh, this one's probably for me. Uh, can we build Blazor and deploy into ARM64? I don't see any reason why not. Uh, that that should just work fine. And we'll talk more about ARM64 later. Uh, I'm just trying to see if there's any uh, ch -ch 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 any other things. Uh, ch -ch -ch. It, uh, I'll just comment on uh, uh, Dave McCarter's got uh, that he's that there's a perf issue with the latest VS uh, update. Um, I am on an internal. Uh, preview here. So don't look at performance on my machine. And I'm also making mistakes. And my machine right now has a headache. And I'm on an underpowered machine. So um, I, I, I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm, it might. Um, we, we work on performance all the time. And sometimes in order yeah, to go. So there, was, there was a Twitter thread about some performance okay. issues in the latest update. And Jared's on it. So it's okay, probably good. true. Okay. okay, how about this one? I would want you to test what I'm going to say, okay? I believe I know the answer to this, but you definitely need to test this, okay? Uh, I, I believe that this is compiler-based and that, therefore, it is assembly-specific. So if you have one assembly and that assembly uh, is set to not, uh, not through exceptions, but to do the underflow overflow because you're doing some magic where you want you know, overflow or you need the performance, that that assembly will have the behavior specified in that assembly and that the calling assembly is irrelevant. But you should test that because it's too important. Uh, I cannot imagine it working a different way, but I want you to test it before right. you get your business off. Okay. So is it fair to say that that particular piece of information will be in this document that you're going to write? Yeah, yeah. And, and Rich is going to be reviewing it. So we'll make yeah. sure it doesn't get lost because I'm not taking notes right now. But yes, yeah. we, we, we definitely need to cover some of these uh, some of these things. So yeah, thank you, folks, because we've definitely in this conversation, my blog post just got more complicated. So thank you. Yeah. So I think the answer to this one is yes. It's, it's absolutely true. It is. It is absolutely true. Um, I don't know about hashing and encryption algorithms. I assume you are correct on that those being some of the algorithms, but it's absolutely true that some um, need this, require this. But again, you know, if, if I was requiring this, I would put checked around that section of code um, because I would want this to be like immensely obvious that this must be, I mean, unchecked. I'm sorry. I said checked. I meant unchecked. Um, checked means we'll throw the exception. Unchecked means that we'll, we'll roll around. Um, and I would put unchecked in the code for those uh, and not risk somebody accidentally setting um, the, the project property. Uh, of course you can. Yes, Hunter is speaking somewhere and uh, it, it, is a, it is a virtual user group so everybody can go and we, we like Scott and um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, sure. Uh, he's, uh, 
Yeah, he said he was a dev intersection earlier this week. I think he's still there. Okay, well, I think we've caught up with all the questions now. Great. Okay, uh, so good. Um, I have a couple more things I can talk about on, on templates, but we want to go on to other things in just a second. Um, sure. So I think I've got the stuff on that. Um, I, I, I want to just talk at kind of a high level. So uh, Rich, I know you've got some stuff about, um, and let me just switch over to this. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. I do want to talk about the repo just for a second for um, the, the templating repo. So uh, there's three people that interact with templates. There are people that use templates and uh, I'll, I'll go over a couple of things that are coming for those folks. We've got people that author templates and we're hoping to increase that usage, uh, the, that group quite significantly in the, next, uh, in the next cycle. And then we have people that host templates. And this is a very small number of people, but you, everybody cares a lot about them. Um, the lists that we come up with this have never been more than 10 teams on the planet. We probably are missing some, figure we're off by, by doubling. Um, but we do have changes for template authors and we want them to reach out to us. So we make, we, we've attempted not to break them, but we are doing things that could potentially break them and it is not our intention to break anybody. So what we've done is we have got some new discussions um, in our uh, repo. Let's see, so we can get this thing to behave. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's just, my pen thing is on the whole thing. What I want to show you is that we have hosts and API. Uh, this is a new discussion space, and so please reach out to us here if you are hosting, uh, or you know anybody who is, you can just put a, something in their ear. Um, this is primarily editors, so Visual Studio is one of our uh, hosts, the CLI is one of our hosts. If you're a template author, we're gonna put some stuff here. Um, there's some resources that are right here in our template authoring resources. So uh, I'll open this up real quick. And this is some videos. We will be increasing uh, what we have here. We also, for template authors, hope to, in the .NET 6 timeframe, we hope to finally get what we've thought about for a long time. We've dreamed about it for a long time. We think we'll finally get the template template. So that is going to be a template that helps you to write your templates. And there may be more than one of them, um, but that work is, is ongoing. We've done a ton of other work. There's a blog post coming on that, including making it easier for uh, template authors to localize. That's something we wanna uh, really work on. So there, there's a bunch of stuff coming for template authors. Uh, that is part of a long journey. So we want to partner with template authors to build a great ecosystem in much the same way that we did with .NET tools. And so we want it to be something that if you have this kind of a problem, you just go do that. You never think about the fact, of course I'm gonna write a .NET tool. Of course I'm gonna use a template. And we're not quite there yet because it's been too hard to do. So we're, we're working on that. Um, and then uh, for template users, um, the biggest thing we're doing is that CLI templates appear in Visual Studio uh, starting someplace in the uh, in in the cycle we're in right now. Um, I think it was um, oh gosh, God, now that the name numbers are going crazy in my head, but like sixteen ten or something like that came in with CLI templates being uh, what you saw in uh, Visual Studio for founding project, not not item templates, just project templates. And as part of that, a bug that has been longstanding became much worse. And that bug is that when you updated your SDK, any templates you installed explicitly from the command line got lost. And uh, those are now, uh, that bug is now fixed. Um, it required a redesign of part of the system, but that work is done. So that's the biggest thing we've got. There's also differences to uh, a lot of output. We've cleaned up a lot of the output from install and list and we also have a new search. So that's kind of the, the high point of new stuff. All that'll be in the blog post. Um, and so I think I wanna not spend tons of time more on templating because I spent way more and I told you I would, except to answer any questions that we, we still have going. You're creating them, yay, we wanna make them easier. Uh, so yeah, we wanna make it easier to create, uh, to create templates. And we think that every team um, ought to have templates that help them and that much of those should be shared. And we just hope that we can uh, we can make this significantly easier. Uh, we do not plan on changing the basic architecture. Uh, we have too much invested in that from the ecosystem point of view. There are too many existing templates for us to say, yeah, we're gonna change, uh, you know, template adjacent. We're not planning on doing that, so yeah. Okay, any other questions or should we talk about, you wanna talk about ARM64. So uh, let's see if we have, uh, <laughs> what 
Well, thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad that you know, I'm glad, thank you. I'm glad you know about LTS. It's long-term support. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look for, go look for .NET uh, servicing uh, or .NET core servicing and, and make sure you understand what our plan is for servicing. Because uh, .NET 5, it's only here for three months after .NET 6 is released. So if you're using .NET 5 right now and you have a you know, organization that has to plan for your releases, you need to be planning on a release sometime between uh, when we come out with .NET 6 and three months after that. And that's generally in many organizations that takes some pre-planning. We, we have released our schedule for a long time, but not everybody's seen it. So that's the LTS thing. Uh, .NET item templates and VS. You know, I would love to hear more about why you want them. Um, and if it's because you're an author and you want to make sure your item templates are available there, then um, you might give us a little bit of hints as to how we help them show up at the right place. Um, because that's one of the reasons we're not just going to slam them in is we don't want to uh, spam people on item templates. It's just the, the where it is in the flow. Um, having that list expand massively will be even worse than having it expand in the new uh, project dialogue where we already had a search and we already have some other features that made that list getting bigger, uh, more palatable. And so we're not going to jump, we wanna do item templates, but we wanna do them right. Um, and so if you, if, if this, whatever reason you want them for would be great if we had that as part of our thinking. Anything else? Uh, no, yeah, nothing that I think anyway. you and I can handle. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna switch switch gears for a sec. Yeah, I let's think. Un, let's unshare me, and uh, unless did you want me to share something for you? Well, I, I can do it from here. Okay, great. Okay, I have the powers. So, um, uh, one of the things that I've been working on over, over the last few years is our ARM sixty four support. So. Um, we added support for ARM64 way back in, I think, .NET Core 3.0. Uh, that was focused on Linux. Um, and uh, while there was like a ton of work, and um, you know, uh, it was a you know very real project, it was kind of a bit of a non-event from the perspective that you know there weren't that many people who needed that. Um, and then the user experience for adopting ARM64 on Linux was very simple. Um, no brainer. So now fast forward to today and we have ARM64 on Apple Silicon machines. Um, and then uh, we also have um, ARM64 on Windows laptops primarily. And so that experience is actually a fair bit different. So the ARM64 part of the project uh, was relatively straightforward to support um, Apple Silicon and Windows. Um, a little more difficulty on the Apple side, but that's fairly irrelevant to what I want to talk about. But both on Windows and Mac, um, there's this X64 emulation mode. Um, and that is that seemed to uh, me and others as very simple at, at the start and has turned out to be quite challenging. So uh, I've been working on this spec, um, it's on GitHub. I'll just uh, definitely go back. need to have bigger text than that. Oh yeah, it's like oh yeah. This it's is like, not hmm, flying I, at all for me. It's it's. I not guess I have a four K monitor. Um, yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so this is in the .NET Designs repo. It's um, uh, PR number two seventeen. And uh, so basically, this is this plan that I've been working on, uh, and there's actually two other documents that I've written before that. And so I'm just gonna in like maybe 120 seconds uh, explain what's going on here. So the basic issue is that with X64 emulation, you can have both the ARM64 and X64 version of the product installed at the same time. Uh, there isn't, like on Windows, there's always been this um, C program files x86 directory. Rich, can I stop and just point out one thing? When we're talking about product here, what we mean is the uh, SDK and run and runtime can both be installed. Visual Studio um, is still a x64 um, uh, product. Well, it's currently still a 32-bit product. 32-bit, well, you it's are, soon to be. it's an x86 product right now, I'm sorry. Yeah, right, uh, but, but we have plans. 
Yeah, so there's this is no announcement about yeah. Visual Studio for ARM 64. That 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 was. I just meant we have plans for X64. I think we. Yeah, yeah, X64 is absolutely the next step in um, Dev 17. Yeah. I, I I'm not good at remembering which it, Dev. We have a lot of numbers, and we're and I, on right now. Okay, yeah. so back to the topic. Um, so you can have multiple versions installed. And so, like, this is where we're planning on installing them. So into the normal place, but in an X64 specific um, directory. Um, and yeah. And so I'm just the, maybe that's ba basically what, um, yeah, we probably should leave it at that. There's a bunch of other stuff in this post, in this um, design doc. The main point is, is that, um, Actually, I'm just going to get rid of this at the moment. The main point I wanted to raise is that um, uh, X64 emulation is taking us more time. It was still intended to, to be supported for the .NET 6 release. And um, it, will be, it will be not transparent to you from the perspective that if you install the X64 product, um, there'll be this other directory. And we're trying to make it so that um, you can just use the ARM64 SDK, which is the native SDK, to target both X64 and ARM64 um, apps. Rich, so I, want to, I want to clarify something you just said. Okay, so you just said if you have the X64 product, then you're going to have this X64 directory. But that's just on an ARM64 machine, correct? Yes. So basically our, our plan is... is the the native product should always be installed to the native location. So if you install the X64 product on an X64 machine, it'll go to the normal place, C program files or uh, user local share.net on, yeah. on Mac OS. If the, the only place where this emulation concept even exists is on ARM64 machines. Now, it actually does have some, it's somewhat analogous to the, 32-bit install on Windows. The reason that that is much less of a problem is that um, Windows has a whole subsystem for 32-bit, and they have both registry and file virtualization, and they even have a 32-bit command prompt that you can go use. And so it's a very explicit experience, whereas this new one is kind of much more implicit in nature. I guess the, the other thing to add is uh, we're using this as an opportunity to stop adding the non-native product to the path. Uh, and we're actually potentially going to do this for the 32-bit install as well on Windows. So the basic policy going forward will be the only product version that gets installed in the path is the native one, no matter what. Um, by default. Right. I, I was just worried the way that you had said that. I didn't want anyone to think that there was going to be, you know, some massive change where the SDK was suddenly going to be installed in a in a completely different location. Right. So let's switch topics. Um, yeah, there's one question here, which is this live. So the ARM64 bit is work. So ARM64 um, with x64 emulation, ARM64 works okay that's fine but the, the situation that rich is talking about um is this is where we have the uh an arm 64 machine and you um want to run the x64 version of the sdk or runtime that is that is the scope which is not yep. that is not like that is that is planned and uh we're, we're working on it yep all, all true um all right okay so the other thing i wanted to talk about was this so I've been working on these uh, conversation blog posts, and um, which are on the .NET blog. And uh, so I've been trying to do two of these a week. Um, and uh, actually, I think you know it's the feedback has been super positive. So I'm going to continue doing them. I, ironically, I'm not doing two this week, but I'll return to two a week next week, uh, just the way the scheduling worked out. And uh, these are super cool. So the way it works is I write a set of questions. I'll, I'll just click on the, the most recent one. I write a set of questions and um, that's, uh, okay, I'm going the wrong way with the mouse. Um, 
And then uh, I invite a set of engineers to a Teams call. And then I just like paste the first question into the chat. And then all the people start answering the question. And then we take like, you know, less than five minutes per question. And then I copy and paste them to Markdown. And that's the blog post. And uh, there's a lot of interesting insight uh, in these. Some of the questions are intended to be provocative, um, to be interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've also, I think, doing a reasonable job of pulling from a broader set of the team than many people are, like, used to seeing on Twitter, for example. Uh, that'll probably be even more obvious in the upcoming ones. Uh, my goal is to show, like, to give more visibility to the engineers who work on the team, like, give the community more visibility to them and uh, kind of demonstrate uh, you know, the product focus and scenario focus and all those good things. So, um, yeah, hopefully people are enjoying those. So I think that's basically, um, what I wanted to talk about. I have a hard stop at 11, so I don't really want to go yeah, too much yeah. further. Yeah. I think that we're, we're going to shut down pretty quick. It's interesting that, um, uh, and and I, I'd love to follow up on, on this with you, but uh, but Dave's got a um, he, he's got a bunch of exceptions from turning arithmetic uh, overflow underflow checks on. It looks like he may have had tests that were underflowing and overflowing, um, either on purpose or uh, the test just gave weird answers. So, but he did say he had a bunch of tests that were breaking. So definitely, if you add that. You know, pay attention to, to what you're doing uh, when you when you turn that that on. But um, I, I'd love to follow up on that. And if it's if it's interesting, I'll include it in the underflow overflow blog, blog post that, that I'm working on. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. I and mean, you know, uh, so I definitely would like to hear more about um, what you're seeing um, as you look at hundreds. It's going to take a while. Ooh. So hopefully you just have one method someplace that is, is doing something um, uh, unusual. Yeah. I mean, it is possible, it's, that, it's yeah, possible that, that you that, actually need underflow and overflow for something you're doing, in which case then again, I prefer checked and unchecked in the code that needs it because even if you're repeating what you've got at project level, because that project level value could be changed and it's very far from the code that would actually need the checked or unchecked. In particular, if you need, if you need it to be checked, um, then I would, um, uh, I would definitely stick that in the code. Yeah. But I mean, uh, reach out to us. Unchecked. I'm sorry. I said that backwards again, if you need it to be unchecked, um, because I think that, that the, the common yes. overview should be checked. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, we should probably close it out because we do uh, have a hard stop and also let us know. We should go over some time. If that's annoying to you, you should let us know and we'll we'll uh, try to tighten it up a little bit. So, Rich, it has been great. Thanks to everybody who uh, who joined us today. I uh, appreciate that very much. Everybody watches on the stream uh, later. And uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh Always appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words, uh, particularly to Kathleen. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.